Today, she's a legend at 60 Minutes, but being a reporter isn't her favorite job. Leslie Stahl shares how a different role transformed her life. Plus, and I just began to weep. A 15 passenger van flips. Everything was crashed, all the windows was busted out. With a group of children inside. They were back there hollering and screaming. Watch an Easter miracle unfold. I knew that he can do anything. On today's 700 Club. Well, is it just bluster or a war clouds really gathering? After striking Syria with Tomahawk missiles, could the United States be getting ready for another showdown? Not in the Middle East, but against that rogue nation, North Korea. The North warns it will defend itself after the United States sent an aircraft carrier strike group toward the Korean Peninsula. Charlene Aaron has the story. North Korea says it will take tough countermeasures if the U.S. opts for military action after moving the USS Carl Vinson aircraft carrier to the waters off the Korean Peninsula. The Pentagon sent the carrier and its battle group after North Korea's latest missile test last week, one of several the country has test fired in recent months. We will hold the U.S. wholly accountable for the catastrophic consequences to be entailed by its outrageous actions, said a spokesman for North Korea's foreign ministry. And this statement came on North Korean television. The United States is dispatching Carl Vinson Nuclear Carrier Task Group again in the waters off the peninsula proves that the U.S.'s reckless moves for invading North Korea have reached a serious phase. If the U.S. dares opt for a military action, it is crying out for preemptive attack and removal of the headquarters. Then North Korea is ready to react to any mode of war desired by the U.S. On Sunday, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said U.S. missile strikes against a Syrian air base in retaliation for a chemical weapon attack also carry a message for other countries. Well, I think the message that any uh, nation can take is if, you're, if you violate international norms, if you violate international agreements, if you fail to live up to commitments, if you become a threat to others, uh, at some point, a response is likely to be undertaken. And I think in terms of North Korea, uh, we've been very clear that our, object, our objective is a denuclearized uh, Korean peninsula. We have no objective to change the regime in North Korea. That is not our objective. Tillerson also shared concerns about how close North Korea is to developing nuclear weapons that could be put on missiles that could reach the U.S. The assessments are obviously um, somewhat difficult, but clearly he has made significant advancements in delivery systems. And that is what concerns us the most. U.S. Navy ships are a common presence in the Korean region and are in part a show of force. On Saturday night, the Pentagon said a Navy carrier strike group was moving toward the Western Pacific Ocean to provide more of a physical presence in the region. President Trump's national security advisor, H.R. McMaster, calls the move to send the carrier group a prudent measure to maintain readiness and presence in the Western Pacific. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. You know, those uh, Koreans, it's all bluff and bluster. They, they're a failed state. Their GDP is just pathetic. It's, uh, uh, what, what is it, about $3 billion or something? They have almost no money. <clears throat> they're totally dependent on China for oil and coal and, and various necessary supplies. Their people are starving to death, and it's just a pathetic thing. Uh, and the question is, those people don't have enough power, enough uh, physical strength to overcome that victim, vicious dictatorship that's been in effect since the grandfather of the current dictator. And uh, they make a lot of noise, <clears throat> but the problem is they do have nuclear bombs. And they are building a delivery system, and they are a danger because they're crazy. So we, we've told them talking is over. Now, something else happened. I cannot understand myself why the Democrats made such a foolish move in relation to the Supreme Court uh, nomination of Neil Gorsuch. 
I can't understand it. Here's an ideal person, and they decided they wanted to filibuster him. And in order to filibuster him, what they've done is incite uh, the uh, Republican majority to invoke the nuclear option, which means henceforth any Supreme Court nominee that the president puts forward will get those votes. All they need is a simple majority. And if Republicans hold together, which apparently they will, uh, that means that the president may have another two members of the Supreme Court, and the composition of the court will be changed for the next two decades at least. This is a major thing that we're talking about. Now, what was done now essentially has restored the court's balance 5-4, the same one we had with Scalia, with Kennedy being the swing boat that you never know exactly what he's going to do. But President Trump says Neil Gorsuch will go down as one of the truly great justices in history after Gorsuch was sworn in to the Supreme Court in two ceremonies on Monday. John Jessup has that. That's right, Pat. Neil Gorsuch took his position as the newest justice on the Supreme Court after two ceremonies, first a private one, then another in the White House Rose Garden. The court now returns to a narrow conservative majority, and President Trump is counting the appointment as a political victory. The most important thing that a president of the United States does is appoint people to the United States Supreme Court. And I got it done in the first 100 days. That's even nice. I am humbled by the trust placed to me today. I will never forget that to whom much is given, much will be expected. Gorsuch's appointment comes after a bitter partisan fight in which Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell invoked the so-called nuclear option, allowing Republicans to approve Gorsuch's nomination with a simple majority. His swearing in comes nearly 14 months after the seat was left vacant with the unexpected death of Justice Antonin Scalia. Pat, back to you. I want to restate. Uh, Harry Reid set up the nuclear option for district court and circuit court. So all of the lower courts of the federal system are now open to a simple majority to approve them by the Senate. The one thing they had left off the table was the Supreme Court. This action that just taken place before this vote was uh, the Supreme Court. Therefore, all of the federal appointees, all of the judges, all of the lower court judges, all the top court judges, the Republican majority and with a president in the White House can put them in office. This is a major, major breakthrough and uh, one which should not be taken lightly. And uh, it means that the control of the Senate is now vital. Well, it's coming up on Easter and John has a story on that. That's right, Pat. Each Easter, Hong Kong Christians look for ways to unify their churches. And this year, they're hosting a rare exhibit called Inspired. It's a showcase of ancient manuscripts, scrolls, and artifacts that prove the Bible's authenticity. Our CBN News Asia correspondent, Lucille Toulousan, gives us a look inside. This is a replica of the Gutenberg Press, the first printing machine that printed the first book in Europe, which is the Bible. It is printing that absolutely allowed the Bible to be distributed to the whole world. Rusty Maisel has been manufacturing replicas of the Gutenberg Press for the past 20 years. I was able to get into the schools that would not, under no ordinary circumstances, allow Bible items into the school. And, and so that, that's the reason for me building presses and keeping one, is that it gets my Bibles into public schools. The Gutenberg printing machine is among the more than 75 items on display at Hong Kong's St. Andrew's Church. Included are rare artifacts, ancient scrolls, and manuscripts that tell the history of the Bible and how it was preserved through time. People need to be affirmed that the Bible is true and trustworthy, and they, they need to be inspired by its story of uh, its preservation. People uh, sacrificing oftentimes uh, life to uh, preserve the Word. This story is inspirational and builds confidence in the Bible and ultimately we hope 
will drive people to a deeper relationship with the Lord uh, through reading scripture. And even for people who are, who are not believers, cause them to consider the wonderful evidence that we have for Christianity. The Inspired Exhibit has given the churches here in Hong Kong a very special tool that they can use to prove to the people here that God's word is authentic and that it's the only thing that can give permanent hope, especially during times of political uncertainty. We have uh, political changes. Uh, people will know through this exhibit um, to know the um, God's word is indestructible and also reliable. And so we can trust our history, our future uh, into God's hands. How this exhibit will, will actually benefit the people of Hong Kong is if we as Christians come, we see it, but then we take out to the streets of Hong Kong the fact that our faith is real and is authentic. God is using the inspired exhibit to promote His Word to different parts of the world. Next stop is St. Petersburg and Moscow on the 500th year anniversary of the Reformation. Lucille Talusan, CBN News, Hong Kong. Thanks, Lucille. Well, finally today, a tragic story. We here at CBN are mourning the loss of a longtime friend and employee, Clark Julian. Clark and his wife, Sally, were shot to death Sunday by their 23-year-old son, Stephen. He also tried to shoot an aunt and an uncle later Sunday, but his uncle disarmed him and he was later arrested. The uncle told the Virginia Pilot newspaper that Stephen had struggled with mental illness in the past, but the shootings are still a mystery as police are still investigating. Clark started at CBN in 1981 and worked his way up through the ranks to work in purchasing electronic equipment. CBN issued a statement saying, the entire CBN community is reeling from this tragedy. Clark was a valued employee for many years and was much beloved by his colleagues here. We offer our most sincere condolences to his family. And Pat, of course, we are praying for everyone involved. Well, we are indeed. It's a great tragedy. And um, we're trying to get some information. Unfortunately, uh, he was under psychiatric care uh, at one time, but we don't know what treatment he was receiving because all this stuff is confidential. Sooner or later, it will come out. And the thing that I am concerned about is that so many of these senseless shootings, these rampages that we find like in Virginia Tech and other places, the shooters were on some kind of psychedelic or, or a psychotic or whatever type of medication you want to call it. But they're giving that stuff, uh, in a sense, indiscriminately. I think, uh, you know, Paxil and some of these others, uh, they've become household names. But many of the people who take them have psychotic episodes which lead to mass slayings of their fellow human beings. And I think we need to get at the bottom of it. And in my opinion, has not been near enough uh, research done to determine the causes of something like the tragic shooting of this valued longtime employee of CBN by his 23-year-old son, who I understand was a medical tech at a local hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, it defies reason why this would happen, but that would account for it if we could get to the root. But we've got to get the medical records, and we can't get them because they're sealed. But I'm sure a grand jury could get them, a court order could get them, and we don't have access to that. All right, Terry. Well, coming up, you know her as Leslie Stahl, but her grandchildren know her as Lolly. The iconic journalist joins us to talk about the best job she's ever had after this. Well, welcome back. Uh, I don't think I'm bragging to tell you that I have 15 grandchildren, and I just recently had my 10th great-grandchild. So I believe in a lot of little children running around are the most precious thing. And people who've had that experience can tell you few things in life compared to being a grandparent. Our next guest is going to share her personal experience with us. She's an award-winning journalist who's now enjoying a new chapter in her life called, quote, Becoming Grandma. Oh, Walter, I am just being told by a high lieutenant that the choice is Bush. Leslie. 
You know her as a 40-year veteran of CBS News. Leslie Stahl has been everything from White House correspondent to investigative reporter for the long-running news program 60 Minutes. But she says the most vivid and transformative experience of her life didn't happen to Leslie the journalist. It happened when Leslie became a grandmother. She says she was hit with a jolt of joy so intense and unexpected she wanted to investigate it. So she did and wrote a book about it called Becoming Grandma, The Joys and Science of the New Grandparenting. Oh, she's charming. She's lovely. You've seen her on the 60 Minutes. And can you believe, I can't think of Leslie Stahl as being a grandma, but she's written a book called Becoming Grandma. Leslie, good to have you with us. I can't believe you're a great grandfather. Great, with 10 of them and one more coming. Stunning, stunning. Yeah, my wife said, you know, I think we've lost count. I think it's only nine. And I said, no, honey, let's go over the, you, you forgot Annabelle. Oh, yeah, Annabelle. You're getting to a dozen, I can <laughs> feel it. It's coming. But you know, what I found is yeah. that grandparents today are not grandparents. You yeah. know, they they look younger, they have a lot of energy. Sure. The grandparents are the great grandparents and there are so many now. It's a whole new population in the country. You know, I, I had a little struggle with my son. My son had the children, many of them, and then they started having uh, uh, children. And so he was grandpa. And so I said, what am I? Yeah, what do what they well, call Well, we'll call you Big Daddy. So I'm oh. Big Daddy. Big Daddy, Big Daddy. Big Daddy. So that, that's it's okay, Big Daddy. Okay. <laughs> hey, well, tell me, uh, in your family, uh, who was it? it? Was it your son, your daughter, who had the children that you became the grandmother of? I have one child, a, a daughter. One daughter. And she, uh, you know, actually, I thought I'd given her the perfect childhood yeah. as an only child. When she told me she was going to have two, I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. And yeah. uh, it's wonderful. It is the wonderful. The second one comes along and you think, am I going to love that one as much? And you do. It's the same well, all over you again. You said something in your book. It's interesting that, that men apparently, even their hormones change when one of these little babies comes on the scene. Tell us about that. Well, I looked into the biochemistry of grandparenting. Yeah, yeah. And the grandmother has one experience, which is total, complete physiological body change. The grandmother The does? grandmother has complete body change, brain changes. Yeah. She has doused her body with this hormone that uh, attaches, it's a bonding hormone, and she's mm -hmm. attached to the baby physically. The father has, <laughs> the <laughs> father, the grandfather not as much, but the father also has hormone changes. Yeah. The father, and he started, the men don't want to know this. I'm, I don't want to upset them. Well, they they get start estrogen? getting a little estrogen. The, the, they get feminine? Not feminine, but they get nested. You nested. know, they're, <laughs> they're compelled to focus themselves on okay. the nest. And our body is a, a miracle because we change so sure. much to accommodate the need to take care of those babies. Well, what did it do to you? You held that little grandbaby for the first oh my time. God. It was, it was titanic. The really? emotion, the connection, the physical bonding mm -hmm. was enormous. And before I found out it was chemical, I was confused because it was so intense and so deep. And here's what I found. I, yeah. I wondered if it was just me, yeah. Maya yeah. all by myself here. And it's one of the reasons I wrote the book. And I found out that most grandmothers, not mm -hmm. all, but most grandmothers have this. And we are just sent into ecstasy. 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 Over our grandchildren. And here's something else, Pat, that yeah. I found out. This is not right or left or East Coast or West Coast. It is not related to anything but being a human being. Mm -hmm. It's universal. Grandparent love. Oh, it, it is universal. It was amazing. And you can relate to yeah. another human being if you're a grandparent and they're a grandparent. Now, let me ask you, I, I don't want to get negative on it, but you've got a daughter. She's yours. The, 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 the line comes from you to her to the little baby. But there's a husband in there, and you are a grandparent, and the baby begins to bond to you. What about him? I mean, does he resent you? Does he love you and bring you in? I mean, how does that work? Well... The grandmother, this is all generally, it's yeah, right. not universal, but generally the grandmother feels that connection to the baby right away right. from the minute she touches that child. Mm -hmm. the, the grandfather, he has a little beat. He needs to see the baby relating back. 
Yeah. Usually. So the baby might be three months old, four mm -hmm. months old, and one day the baby looks right into the grandfather's eyes and he is totally hooked. Yeah. <laughs> he is just like the grandmother, sometimes even more, sometimes yeah. even more than the grandmother. And they are definitely in this together, grandma and grandpa. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing I found, Pat, is that step grandparents yeah, well, yes, can yes. feel exactly the same connection. Well, now, a step, go through the process of getting to be a step grandpa. Who is that? Well, uh, second marriage. Second marriage. And uh, maybe you're marrying a woman All right. whose daughter gets pregnant. Okay. And the daughter has a child, and this husband is there at the beginning All right. and has the same connections that, that the biological grandfather has. That and, baby. And, and, and this cuts across. Uh, Racial, ethnic lines? Right oh, across. this is totally universal. You can go it's to the amazing. most primitive societies, yeah. India, China, you mm -hmm. can go anywhere in the world, and grandparents are all walking around madly in love <laughs> with, <the little> <laughs> with <laughs> grandchildren. It's amazing. It's amazing, and you can talk. If you meet another grandparent, doesn't matter what walk of life, mm -hmm. you're already in a community. It's beautiful. And feeling these emotions. You know, again, I I've encountered... Uh, parents that wanted to cut the grandparents out. We have oh, any, tell, you, talk about You that. see this? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. This was the most painful thing I discovered when I wrote this book, that there are actually grandparents yes. who are not allowed to see their own grandchildren. They are denied access. And these poor grandparents, they have no idea what they did. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they were real serious abusers, it's understandable. But mm -hmm. these are grandparents who raised terrific kids, and they have no idea well, what has happened. Well, why is that? What well, there's many on? reasons, and none of them sounded good to me. Yeah. You know? I mean, why? But it is it's just heart-rending. It is heart-rending. And it's not good for the children. Mm -hmm. Those parents are not putting their children first because children need their grandparents. Mm -hmm. You know, I found that with my, my grandchildren. They have two sets of living grandparents, and it is the most stabilizing thing for them to know that they're part of a family and that they're, they're, you know, their ancestors are still alive, <laughs> and they can look back to Grandpa and Grandma, and, and there's something there. You know, Grandpa's <laughs> job, yeah. job, his role in life, right. is to do what you just said, give mm -hmm. the grandchild a sense of family, a sense yeah. of connectedness, a sense of history. And kids, there have been very few studies about this, but the few have shown that children who are connected to their grandparents yeah. do better in school, they don't act up as much, really? they're just stabler. And it's because of what you said. They have a, a sense of their own history, a sense that they come from something and that they're going to move forward to something. How do you instill that with your grandchild? What do you do? Or do you have well, to instill it? It's just there. Our job. Yeah. <laughs> Grandmothers and grandfathers. Okay. We have only one job. Yeah. Love them. That's it. That's it. Okay. We don't have to teach them table manners. We have to <laughs> give them, you know, yeah. business because they're not doing their homework. Just love them. I, I have changed a, a, a dirty diaper for one of our grandchildren. It, it isn't a pleasant grandfatherly no, task, trust me. But you can do it. I can do it. <laughs> I fumbled with the task, but I can do it. <laughs> Did, did you have to do that? Of course you did. Well, of course. Babysitting yeah. is, for me, the greatest joy. Of course, when they don't stop crying, it gets a little frustrating. Yeah. But, but uh, I live to, to babysit. It's I live marvelous. to be with my grandchildren. I can't wait to see them. How do you handle your job? Or is the job taking a second place now in, in, in this greater scheme of things? Well, I mean, if you were to study me. Uh -huh. You would see that more and more and more of my stories take place in Southern California where my grandchildren live. Okay. All right? All right. So I get out there as much as possible. Sure. And there's this movement, by the way, Pat, when people retire today, uh -huh. more and more are picking up, selling the house they've lived in for 40 years and moving to be in their grandchildren's lives. Really? Really. It's a well, huge and, and trend. The, jam, the grandchildren welcome that? I mean, they well, the welcome The grandchildren it. welcome it. They do. And the young parents, believe it or not, more than in the past several generations, need our help. Mm -hmm. Because child care 
is absurdly expensive, yeah. outrageously expensive. Yeah, indeed. And they need us, and they need us for the babysitting, but they also need our money, yeah. <laughs> they need well, our help financially. And it also doesn't come with an instruction manual. You know? No, <laughs> no manual. Yeah. You're, you're out there blind, but, well, that's a little bit of, my book's a little yeah. bit of a... Well, I, I read this book, it's kind of like a compendium. It's like a Leslie Stahl, Dr. Spock. You've got all kinds of things. Well, it's like there. a 60 minutes investigation. I, I, I set exactly. out that way. Yeah. What's going on here? What's, what, is, yeah. what is our role? Um, what's, what is happening between grandparents and their children. Mm -hmm. I think we're having, generally again, better relationships, um, yeah. grandparent to child, than earlier generations, and well, mainly because they need us more. I love it. I tell you, I was with my great-granddaughter, little oh. Annabelle, oh. And, and she put one of the wettest, sloppiest kisses oh. on my cheek. <laughs> and you just I, went you, into oil. Yeah, yeah, really, it's so sweet. Oh, my God. <laughs> we live for this. We do. <laughs> and who knew? You can't tell another person. That's right. You have to live it to understand the depth of what we're talking yeah. about. All right, how do they get the book? Is it available wherever? Yeah, you can get it in your local bookstore. You can get Amazon. it on Amazon. You can get it on your Kindle. Facebook, I even Kindle. read it. You can get it the audio. Okay. Well, it's fantastic. Well, Leslie, you are tremendous. It's so good to see you. Thank I you. I usually interview you. This I is very know, strange. I know. <laughs> it's a different role, but I'm enjoying it immensely. Well, me too. Well, God bless you. Thank, Thank you for you. this book. Leslie Stahl, ladies and gentlemen, Becoming Grandma. What an interesting book. If you're interested, I mean, there's so many great uh, grandparents and grandparents. This is, as I say, is a compendium. It's like a, a female doc, Dr. Spock. It'll tell you everything about how to be a good grandparent. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank Leslie. You. All right, here's Terry. I love your grandma name, Leslie. Lolly, it's wow. awesome. <laughs> well, coming up, you're going to witness what's been called the Martin Miracle after a church van full of children was hit by a drunk driver. I'll never, ever forget what I saw. Uh, the van's over in a ditch, broken glass and parts of the van all over the road. I thought somebody had died. See how that crash became cause for celebration just in time for Easter. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. Pastor Roddy Turner had to make a few changes to his Easter sermon two years ago. He opened with the story of the empty tomb, and he told the congregation that, quote, God did something there that only God can do. Then Pastor Turner said, God is still doing those things. And he pointed to the previous Palm Sunday after a van from his church filled with children was hit by a drunk driver. So I get to the accident site and I'll never ever forget what I saw. Uh, the van's over in a ditch. Uh, it's all torn in, bashed in, and I just began to weep. Roddy Turner pastors a church in the small town of Martin, Georgia. For years, he has trusted Audrey Cowles with the van ministry, driving children to and from church each week. When somebody wants to come to church, you're gonna try to make a way. It's something to reach the children, and they wanted to come, and so and it's a good place to come to, reach, you know, to serve God. The week before Easter 2015, Audrey drove a van full of children home from church when they were hit by a drunk driver. We start flipping, flipping. I guess it had to be two or three times or more. And the only thing I could say, Lord, when is this going to stop? And it just landed perfectly in the grass, all the way on the other side of the road. One child had been ejected from the vehicle as it rolled. Her condition and the condition of the others was unknown. She was out the window under the, under the tire. Everything was crashed, all the windows was busted out. Is the kids all right? They were back there hollering and screaming. I told them to calm down, calm down. Everything was gonna be all right. I didn't see no blood and I didn't see anything because I couldn't hardly turn to see what was going on in the back. But I was just praying that everything would have been all right. 
Meanwhile, Pastor Roddy got a call about the crash. He raced to the scene and saw the wrecked van. I can barely see part of it, but I can see it's caved in. I can see the roof is pressed down. Broken glass and parts of the truck and parts of the van all over the road. It really looked terrible. I thought somebody had died. Our sheriff was there and he told me that they had already airlifted some to other hospitals out of town. One helicopter was still at the scene with a little girl inside. And so I walked up to look into that helicopter and I spoke to the little girl and called her by name and reached up and put my hand on her and prayed with her and told her everything was going to be okay. And uh, that was traumatic. I didn't know she was going to live. Soon after, Pastor Roddy gathered the church deacons together to pray. All I had was a lot of unknowns. I knew there were injuries. I didn't know how many were life-threatening. And we just, uh, we just prayed. We just prayed. Later that day and into the next, information about the condition of the children was released. By the next day, everybody had been released from the hospital. Everybody had gone home. We had a broken finger and we had a broken arm. That was the severity of the injuries. The only way I can see it is that it was divine protection. There were people that should have died there. That day, I knew there was a God. I knew that he can do anything. God, you know, he had it. He had everything in his hands. And if you got God on your side, you don't have to worry about anything because he's going to take care of it. Just a week after the crash, the church celebrated Easter with their annual children's production. We call it the Martin Miracle. And that's what it is. God gets all the credit. To him be all the glory and the praise. All the children that were in the van, plus our other children in the children's choir, were right up here on this stage singing for Jesus. Amazing. And their parents were here and family was here. You talking about celebrating. It was a wonderful time. We cried. We just thanked the Lord. It was beautiful. Can you imagine? That was a miracle, mm. an absolute miracle. Well, we have some others we'd like to share with you before we pray for you and for your needs today. This is Phyllis. Phyllis lives in Gastonia, North Carolina. Mm. Suffered with constant dizziness and stumbling for 28 years. Mm. She was watching this program on February 1st this year when she heard you, Pat, give this word of knowledge. Oh, the dizziness is bad, the vertigo. And you've been crying out to God, please help me. Right now, that inner ear is being healed in the name of Jesus. Well, Phyllis claimed that word immediately. The heaviness, the pressure, and the constant sensation of motion were gone. She has not had a problem since that day after 28 years. Years. I tell Praise you, that's an God. incredible miracle. Uh, you know, that's wonderful. But anyway, here's another one. 11 year old Stephanie from Vancouver, British Columbia, had been suffering with a clogged left ear from an ear infection. And one day she and her mother were watching, and they heard you, Terry, say, quote, somebody, your left ear is stopped up, and you had trouble hearing. This is just opening now in Jesus' name. And Stephanie and her mom both said, that's us. And within 24 hours, that sweet 11-year-old Stephanie was completely God. healed. God is good. All right, folks, we want to pray for you. Whatever the need is, there's some tragedies, there's some good times. We're coming up on Easter, the time we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And Terry and I are going to join together, and we're going to pray. Father, mm. we thank you. Together, we thank you. Lord, we worship you. We offer to you the praise of thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. We give you an offering of thanksgiving and praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody has got a left foot. It's twisted in it. It's sort of dragged and crippled. At this moment, the power of God is going through that whole joint, going through your leg, your knee, uh, your hip, and all the way out into your foot. It's straightening up now, and you will plant your foot solid in the name of Jesus. Touch! 
Now, Taylor. someone else, this is going to surprise you because you've had this problem since you were a child. You're a stutterer, and you just learn to live with it and to try to deal with it. But today, you are set free from that. You can speak clearly in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Miasma, the Lord is just setting you free. You will see clearly from this moment on, your, your whole life is going to come into focus. You've been saying, Lord, I don't know what I can do. My life is unfocused. And God just said, right now, your life is focused. I'm giving you laser focus in Jesus' name. Terry, one more. And there's someone else. You have a blockage in your heart, and you're due for surgery. God's opening that for you right now in Jesus' name. Your energy is back. You're Thank not you, going to feel any palpitations anymore. You have been made whole in Jesus' name. Uh, receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. And by the way, folks, on Thursday, we're going to be celebrating on this program what we call Maundy Thursday. And uh, that, uh, I must say, is a little tradition I got from my wife. You, you, you did that, didn't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. I did. And, I, and really, it made Holy Week a yeah. very special well, time. You know, we used yeah. to have uh, communion on Good Friday. And my mm -hmm. wife said, look, you don't do that on Good Friday. That's the day you're, you're fasting and mourning. Uh, until the resurrection. I said, okay, so we'll do it Monday. So, mm -hmm. so we, that, that's when the, the, the Last Supper was on the day before the crucifixion. So we're going to have communion. We'll have a little bread and we'll have a little juice. And if you want to join with us, I just tell you in advance to get ready because that, that's a very important thing we do. And I think it'll be very meaningful for you. That's on Thursday of this week. So praise the Lord. Amen. Well, still ahead. A man prays desperately for a different job. And then I heard someone tell me, you're going to open up a restaurant. I said, no, I am not opening up a restaurant. It's too hard. I ain't going to do it. Watch this man eat those words in his new restaurant. <laughs> And welcome back to the 700 Club. United Airlines is once again under fire after a man was dragged from his seat off a flight at Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. The airline is being threatened with a boycott from passengers after the video went viral. The CEO of United Airlines is defending his employees, saying they were just doing their job dealing with the situation. However, the security officer who pulled the man off the plane has now been suspended. This is the second PR crisis for the airlines in less than a month. The first came after two women were kicked off a flight for wearing leggings. A Swedish attorney says the driver of a stolen truck suspected of crashing into a crowd in central Stockholm has admitted guilt in the terrorist attack. Four people were killed in the incident and 15 wounded. Rakat Akalov drove his car, drove the stolen beer truck into a crowd outside an upscale department store last Friday. He was detained by police for hours later and arrested early Saturday. The lawyer says that Akalov, quote, acknowledges the terrorist charge and agrees to be arrested. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry are back with much more of the 700 Club. It is coming up right after this. got a warning for you. Don't go into the restaurant business. <laughs> that's, that's it's like buying a boat. That's my help from today. 80% of all restaurant startups will fail within the first few years. And that's exactly what happened to Fernando's first eatery. But today, Fernando's running a new cafe. And this time, his restaurant business is booming. Fernando Cano was in his early 30s when his restaurant venture failed, and he and his wife Catherine declared bankruptcy. Looking back now, Fernando says he knows what happened. I was always, I'll do it myself, I'll do it myself, never including God in it, never. The Canos didn't go to church and held tightly to their money. We were raised poor, you know, so every little penny to me was in my pocket, nobody else's pocket. You know, I wanted to keep that money. Fernando started working in corrections. The couple got serious about God, went back to church, 
and soon began to tithe. It is the basis of walking with the Lord. Whatever amount I was tithing to the church, uh, he blessed me with another opportunity to make more money. After years of working the graveyard shift at the prison, Fernando started to burn out and was praying for a change. Lord, I know you got something better for me than this. I've had enough. And then I heard someone tell me, you're gonna open up a restaurant. And I turned around to see who else was in the office with me, but it was just me. I said, no, I am not opening up a restaurant. We did this already. Too hard, I ain't gonna do it. So there I am. A Couple months go by again, and now I'm feeling really, I'm starting to feel burnt out and stressed out. And I said, God, you've got to do something here. And just like he did the first time, he came up to me, whispered in my ear, I already told you, what are you waiting for? Exact words. Soon, the Canos went back into the restaurant business. God spoke to me and told me we were gonna call it Mana Cafe. I didn't know what it meant, so I went and looked it up and it's all about uh, God providing the food for the Israelites when they were in the desert. The venture may have seemed risky, but they say God opened doors for them. It was like, hey, how you doing? My name is Fernando, this is my wife, Catherine. We like your space. Okay, here's the contract, just sign it. And they gave us a good deal. A dollar a square foot to start. Wow, God provided. It's not even work to me because I love what I enjoy doing. To me, it's a lot of fun. The couple credits this favor to their commitment to tithing from their business. I have that faith in God that he's gonna take care of us no matter what. As long as I do my little part, he's gonna do the rest. Being a tither is what puts the blessings in your life, the, the, the protection, the covering, the answers. In addition to tithing, the Canos give food to the homeless in their community. They also give to CBN. It's about compassion, it's about loving, being that person that can help change people's lives. Today, business at Mana Cafe is thriving. The Canos are making four times what they used to, and now they're planning on opening a second restaurant. Together, they challenge others to trust God. Be a 700 Club member. It would be the best thing you could ever do for your life and for your finances. You wanna see God work? Be, be a tither, be a giver. Step out in faith. I tell you, if God ever whispered in my ear, open a restaurant, I think, I, I, Lord, I'm, I'm afraid. <laughs> I a lot of us would say I, that. I, I don't so argue. did he. <laughs> no, I don't want to argue with you, but I just can't. <laughs> you never ran a restaurant, Lord. <laughs> Anyhow, what a wonderful testimony. Fernando and his wonderful wife, uh, Katerine. All right. If you want to receive the blessing of the Lord, the best way to get a blessing is to share one with others. The Bible says, give, and it will be given unto you. And then here's what he says, press down, good measure, running over, will men heap into your bosom four superlatives. It's going to be overflowing so much you can't contain it. And the blessings will run after you. Now, that's what happens when you have God working in your behalf instead of you doing it on your own. So you're saying, I'm part of what God's plan. I want to be part of His plan, and I want to believe God. Now, you can do that to start if you want to. We're just talking about 65 cents. The thing to do is to start. So well, I can't do it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. 65 cents a day. There's nobody, really, who can't afford 65 cents. Mm -hmm. Even if you're on Social Security, you can afford 65 cents. Yeah. 65 cents a day. And you, you, you do that every day, and you get $20 a, a month. And then you do it every month, and you get $240. The next thing you know, your contributions are significant because it's 65 cents a day. So uh, the number's on your screen. It's 1-800-707-000. And, you've got and, and I've got a, a nice little sure. DVD. You know, that secret kingdom can change your life. It is the fundamental laws of, of growth and development, of success in the world. And <clears throat> we'll give this to you.
And I hope it's a blessing. Well, can I tell you what Marianne from Lebanon, what Oregon what said? Because she, she has watched the DVD. Mm -hmm. She says, the secret kingdom and the law of expectation clarified my thinking about what God wants us to do. I grew up in a cloud of negativity. Now I see more clearly. Wow, right. that's awesome. Get out of the negativity. The glass mm -hmm. is half full, not half empty. Okay. Absolutely. All right, questions. Time to bring it on. Bring okay. it on. I'm going to give you two questions in this first one because right. they both Let's have to do with baptism. Ernest asks, if I have accepted Christ into my heart, do I need to be baptized to go to heaven? And Pamela says, I was baptized at age eight. I'm now 66. Do I need to be baptized again to receive the Holy Spirit and become a born again Christian? I've always believed in Jesus, our Savior and God, our Father. Am I already on the right path since I'm a believer? All right. I'll answer that second question first. I'll give you my own testimony. Whether it's biblically correct, I just did it. I wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I wanted the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I wanted it really badly, and I prayed and prayed and prayed. And as I read the the Bible, I realized that these people were baptized in water, and then they received the Holy Spirit. And I figured, look, if this is something that will, will help me get what I'm looking for in the Lord, if this will be an act of obedience, I'm all for it. Now, the question of going to heaven, Paul said, listen, uh, God sent me to preach the gospel. He didn't send me out to baptize people, although there were a few, and he named a few that he baptized. Uh, if baptism was essential to salvation, then Paul would have absolutely baptized everybody he got his hands on, but he didn't, because he knew that it was faith that brought you to heaven. Now, in the Catholic Church, they believe that if you baptize an infant, that the faith of the parents uh, brings that child into the uh, uh, communion, into the covenant of God, the faith of the people who are having the child baptized. The Baptists, on the other hand, believe that that is an act that takes place after you're old enough to accept mm -hmm. the Lord. And it's a submission where you're dead in Christ and alive and from sin. So, uh, it's an important thing to do. I think it's it's clearly something that should be done uh, after you are uh, a believer. But I, I don't want to get in a fight with those who think infant baptism is the way to go. I, I think the idea of, of saying that's dedication is different. But um, Catholics do have the sacrament of confirmation, which happens at that age that you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. The person ratifies his baptism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, okay. I, God is not a Philadelphia lawyer, so I, I don't want to get into splitting hairs on this one. Okay, go ahead. This is Carolyn who says, Dear Pat, if a person attends church and has accepted Christ into her life, is it wrong to have a strictly social drink or two every now and then? I do this only with my husband or family members present, like on a fishing trip or a cookout. I don't want to live one way and then do another. That's not a testament for Jesus that I want to show, but I really don't see anything wrong here. What do you think? All right, here's what Paul said. Here's the rule. Paul said, if meat comes causes my brother to offend, I will eat no meat while the world stands. Now, if you're out having a drink and you don't feel anything wrong with it, okay. But remember, <clears throat> if you having a drink just happens to be in the presence of an alcoholic and he sees you getting that drink, you may cause him to go to hell. And that's what Paul said. I will refrain from doing something that's perfectly legitimate if my action will offend somebody else. That's the rule, all right? This is Jeannie who says, when we're raptured, will we be in heaven where our loved ones who've gone before us are, or will we be in a different heaven? Well, I, I think, uh, as I see it, it's going to be a glorious reunion of everybody. Uh, the Lord's going to make all things new. He's going to create a new heaven, a new earth. I mean, it, it, sooner or later, it's all going to be redone, and we'll all be together, and we'll be spirits. Mm -hmm. Whether you're raptured or caught up to be with him in the Lord or, you know, whenever it happens, uh, you're going to have a spiritual body and uh, you will, of course, be with your loved ones. You'll be with everybody. You'll be with a great family of God. And it will be one glorious reunion, <laughs> believe me. Uh, he said, Paul said, look, I, I, I'll give up anything that I can get to the resurrection of the dead. I mean, it's a big deal. Well, we leave you with today's power minute from Isaiah. With everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Well, tomorrow we've got Hillsong's Darlene Sheck talking about her battle with breast cancer. And for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.